If you were to ask Canadians to name our country's most important public scientist or environmentalist, you'd probably get people scratching their heads a bit and then saying, David Suzuki? I mean, Suzuki has been force-fed to Canadians for close to 50 years, piped into our lives through our government TV and radio stations, which is too bad, because while Suzuki once may have been a scientist, for decades he's been little more than a politician, even filming campaign ads like this one for the Liberal Party. And more than a politician, Suzuki is a keen businessman with an eye for cash. Most government workers couldn't afford an $8 million primary home in Vancouver and several other million-dollar secondary homes, but Suzuki can. That's because he's always got a keen eye for business deals that seem to affect his political statements, too. I mean, just the other day, for example, on Australian TV, he was shilling for a small dictatorship called Bhutan. Remember this? Okay, but let me, everybody I'm, I'm sure has heard of Bhutan, this amazing country. <clears throat> and Bhutan offers a radically different perspective in that the king said what Bhut Bhutanese are interested in is not G GNP, gross national product, but GNH, gross national happiness. Happiness and well-being is the purpose of governments and the economy is there to serve those ends, not just steady growth forever. And that's something, again, I think worth we're looking to. Yeah, but they did that pretty much by closing their doors to outside. Well, their so doors they, were closed yeah. and they opened them mm. and they discovered to their amazement that the rest of the world regards progress and development as money. Their students started to come back to the country when they opened the gates and said, you're not going to believe what they think development is. And the king said, no, it's about happiness. Yeah, except for the 100,000 Nepalese who were kicked out of the country in this new form of apartheid. See, Bhutan is one of the world's poorest countries, poorer than North Korea. It has terrible child mortality rates, high child labor rates. Literacy for girls is just 38%. There are only two doctors for every 100,000 people in Bhutan. So why would Dr. Suzuki say it's so amazing there and even go on Bhutan state-run propaganda TV to say so? Well, Suzuki is a little business venture in Bhutan, taking rich Canadians there to traipse around for fun and profit. It's a business model for Suzuki. He's for sale. You can rent him by the hour, like John Abbott College of Montreal did, to give a speech for $30,000, and plus uh, more than $10,000 in expenses, too. Or how about another example? A U.S. foundation gave Suzuki's foundation hundreds of thousands of dollars in grant money to study farm salmon, Suzuki later attacked farm salmon as unhealthy and dangerous, even calling it poisonous. Coincidence? BC is a large farm salmon industry, by the way. These were Americans who prefer Alaskan wild salmon. On another show, I'll take you through what Suzuki says about farm salmon and show you the money trail. It's outrageous that a Canadian would take money from a foreign lobby and attack a Canadian industry. But again, that's sort of Suzuki's business model. He does it to the oil sands, too. So if David Suzuki isn't a real scientist anymore, if he isn't neutral and objective, if his opinions can be bought, who is a real scientist? Someone working for the public interest. Well, I have a suggestion for such a name. Dr. Patrick Moore. Back in the 1970s, Moore was an idealistic ecology student in Vancouver who felt moved to oppose the U.S. Navy's plan to detonate a hydrogen bomb off the Alaska coast. So along with other hippies, he set off in a little boat to confront the massive U.S. Navy directly. It was a style and a tactic he'd use often in the years ahead, not just for peace, but for environmentalism, and especially to oppose whaling. Moore went on to become the president of Greenpeace and to lead its phenomenal growth as an organization. But Greenpeace soon became a victim of its own success. Instead of taking a scientific or even idealistic approach to its campaigns, it became increasingly political and even unscientific, anti-scientific. Instead of real PhDs like Dr. Moore, it became staffed more and more by political operators and campaign tacticians who didn't care so much about true science other than the science of fundraising. Moore's clashes with Greenpeace's tilt towards junk science saw him leave the group as much in sorrow as in anger. Dr. Moore now calls himself a sensible environmentalist, someone who wants to achieve his ecological goals but isn't dogmatic about the means. Unlike Greenpeace, for example, he supports nuclear power as safe and clean. 
Sometimes his ideas are remarkably simple, but powerful. In his book, Trees Are the Answer, Dr. Moore makes the obvious case that chopping down trees for construction material is about the most environmental thing you could do and the definition of a renewable resource. Where Greenpeace and other extremists try to block genetically modified food, often in return for big grants from so-called natural health food companies, Dr. Moore embraces GMOs as the solution to problems of starvation and malnutrition, especially in the third world. I could talk about him for a long time, but I won't. I'll talk with him now because he is our special guest in studio today. He's a man who I believe rightfully deserves the title of Canada's most important and most effective public-minded environmental scientist, Dr. Patrick Moore. Welcome to the show. It's good to see you again. Nice to be here, Ezra. Well, last I saw you was on the high seas on the Freedom Cruise we had. You're used to the sea. That's how Greenpeace sort of got its start, taking on the U.S. Navy. Remind our viewers about that. Well, actually, I grew up in boats because I lived on a floating village on the north end of Vancouver Island in my early years, and there was no road. We, we were all, everybody was in boats to get anywhere. So it was kind of natural for me to go on that first voyage of Greenpeace. Actually, I, aside from the captain and the engineer, I, I had been on boats a lot more than any of the other people on that trip. And on through the history of Greenpeace, saving the whales and even the seals, we were standing on frozen ocean, but we were out on the sea. And uh, I, I feel at home on the ocean, and I, I go fishing every summer out of my uh, summer place where I grew up in Winter Harbor on northern Vancouver Island. So I, I just love to get offshore and, and, and be out there in a boat. Now, tell me what motivated you. I mean, the idea of getting in a small vessel and taking on the U.S. Navy, which then, is, as now, was the mightiest Navy that's ever sailed. I mean, that, that's so asymmetrical. That would be like a mouse taking a charge at an elephant. What were you thinking when you got on this little boat going after, what, were they battleships or even aircraft carriers out there? No, actually, they, they drilled a, a huge hole in Amchitka Island and lowered the bomb a mile deep underground there okay. and detonated it uh, on the island. But we, and we were going to that island in order to ha do a protest offshore in our boat. Okay. Uh, I was motivated by the fact that the Vietnam War was at its height. I was opposed to what United, the United States was doing there. The, the Cold War was at its height and the threat of all-out nuclear war. That's what motivated me. And it's really interesting as I think back because actually Greenpeace began with a very strong humanitarian element of preventing all-out nuclear war and the destruction of human civilization. Over the years I was in Greenpeace, till when I left 15 years later, they didn't have a humanitarian bone left in their body at that point. Basically, Greenpeace and much of the environmental movement went from caring about people and the destruction of civilization by nuclear war to believing that humans were the enemy of the earth. Huh. And this is why today, for example, Greenpeace can ignore the fact that two million children are dying from vitamin A deficiency and still they can oppose golden rice, which is the solution to that problem. And m most of the world's scientists, including the Rockefeller Foundation science people, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, the International Race Research Institute, the Helen Keller International, the National Institutes of Health in the United States all support golden rice as a cure for vitamin A deficiency. We'll and talk Green more Peace about is golden rice. We've got a whole segment we're going to go in there. We, you and I have talked about this before. We've talked about it with Bjorn Lomborg. Golden rice, I think, is, is the true agricultural revolution of our time. But we're going to do that after the break. I want to talk to you just a little bit more about what you said about the evolution of Greenpeace from trying to save people to regarding people as the problem itself. Was this an ideological change? Was this a political change, a fundraising change? It almost sounds like one of those death cults to say people are the problem, let's, I mean, did it really go that far? It has gone that far and it went that far a long time ago where basically humans were perceived as the enemy of Mother Earth. And it didn't start out that way though. When the environmental movement began, it was understood that ecology means we're all in the environment, we're all in this together. And over the years, one of the great errors of the environmental movement was to basically give the public the impression that the environment was different than people. That mm. people, in, in other words, that people aren't part of the environment. Mm. And so this, this, this leads you to be able to support campaigns such as their ridiculous policy on energy, which says no fossil fuel, no nuclear, no hydro, and no biofuels now. Greenpeace is against well, using plants to make fuel. What energy do they possibly... Wind and solar, that's it. They say we, it's, it's as if they think we can run our civilization on energy that disappears for five days at a time, like disappears. Yeah. 
right? Yeah, okay, what happens to the night. factories, the schools, the hospitals, yeah. the buildings? Huh. What happens? Yeah, that's an anti-human point of view. Listen, I'm glad we got the whole show today. There are just of what you said, I've got 10 follow-up questions. We've got a lot of time so we can go through the issues one at a time. We're talking with Dr. Patrick Moore. Coming up, has the Earth's population reached capacity? But first, we'll take an objective look at GMOs, including golden rice. That's next on The Soul. GMOs are very, very expensive. Now, the people that, that need this, this food are not going to be able to afford it. Are we going to just create these new crops and then give them away? I simply don't believe that's what's going to happen. This is a very powerful technology and that it's got immense potential. The problem is that it is so powerful, I don't think we should be rushed into it. We simply don't know enough to anticipate the, uh, the consequences of very powerful technologies like this. That was just a short clip. You saw me talk about it last week. It was about 15 minutes we talked about David Suzuki's anti-genetics bias. He, he calls himself a geneticist. He, and 40, 50 years ago, he may have been one. But now I call him an anti-scientist, anti-technologist, who, it, it was a bizarre appearance. He accused GMO scientists of being profiteers when they said they were doing it for free. He accused them of forcing it on farmers. He said we rushed into it, but it was pointed out that we've been testing GMOs for years, even decades. The man had no clue. I think it's safe to say he's a Luddite, an anti-scientist wearing the lab coat of a scientist. And joining us again in studio for the whole show today is Dr. Patrick Moore. I am very excited about what brings you to Toronto. I have in my hand a new brochure from your organization, Allow Golden Rice now, and it's about something you and I have talked about on the show and Bjorn Lomborg and other. It's, it's about rice. It looks golden because it's got vitamin A added to it through a genetic enhancement. Tell me about golden rice and your campaign to allow it. Golden rice was invented by two humanitarian scientists, professors in universities in Europe, one in Switzerland and one in Germany, Ingo Potricus and Peter Beyer. They were aware of the golden rice sorry, of the vitamin A tragedy in Asia and Africa. So, so that's normal rice and there. And this is golden rice. And, go, and it's obviously golden because it's got something added to it. Yeah. It's vitamin no, A, right? Well, the only difference between the two, conventional rice and golden rice, is that golden rice contains beta carotene, which is what makes carrots orange and what makes corn yellow. When normal, cor normal rice has no beta carotene because the rice plant doesn't put it, Normal rice has lots of beta carotene in its leaves, but we don't eat the leaves. Right. doesn't put any there. So therefore, two million people, mostly young children, die each year from vitamin A deficiency. More than malaria, more than HIV AIDS, more than tuberculosis, which are the other main scourges. But those are diseases. Yeah. This is not a disease. It's a nutrient deficiency. Uh, and therefore, you don't have to kill anything in order to fix it. You just have to put beta carotene into these poor children's bodies, yeah. and they will be fine. And it, 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 it's just ridiculous that yeah, where, where people, people are dying? opposing I mean, this. In North America, we're so well fed. You know, most of us eat too much, not too little. Where are the places in the world where kids are dying or going blind because of vitamin A deficiency? Where does that happen? India is a big problem. So is Bangladesh. So is Indonesia. So are many of the southern sub-Saharan African countries. It's basically 250 million preschool children are vitamin A deficient. And 2 million of them, including some, it's not all children that die from vitamin A deficiency, but mostly, 2 million die. And half a million children go blind each year, half of whom die within a year. Now, I've, I've talked about Ingo Potricus on the show before. He was one of the inventors of this. He said, this is for the world. I'm not looking to become a billionaire off this. I, I mean, he basically declared this is his gift to humanity, right? T tell me about the ownership of this technology. Well, it wasn't just his gift. What he did was he figured out how to use the existing technologies of biotechnology right. and what is today called genetic modification. But right. actually, genetic modification is a far broader term than just recombinant DNA biotechnology, which is what we're talking about okay. here, where you take a gene from corn, in this case, and put it into a rice plant. So this isn't like taking a mouse ear and putting it into this. is Nobody does that. So uh, this, this thing, that's, of, that's this thing about putting fish genes into strawberries that's science fiction. is science Science fiction. You know, and, and it's funny you say that because uh, as folks who watch the show last, that's the kind of hocus pocus that David Suzuki was pushing. Taking a, a, a part of corn and putting it in the rice, frankly, it sounds delicious. It's the it's, same it's, gene that puts the, 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 the beta carotene in the kernel of corn. Yeah. They put that gene into rice and it puts it into the seed just yeah. like corn does. Yeah. It's the same. Uh, it's, there's nothing sinister about it whatsoever. So back to the professor, Potricus. Yes. What did he and others do 
to get this idea used. I mean, it's one thing to develop, I mean, to save two million lives a year, that, that would be a greater salvation than almost any, probably up there with penicillin exactly. in terms of saving lives. I mean, exactly. I, I can't think of another uh, innovation that would so immediately, and, and innocent kids. I mean, this isn't, like you say, fixing a disease. This is stopping starving. What, tell me how they went from idea to let's get this out there. They created the invention in the lab by successfully transferring genes from corn to the rice and grew a rice plant, and there you have the yellow corn, the yellow rice, which is golden rice. Uh, then they went to the owners of the patents, primarily Monsanto and Syngenta. Mm -hmm. They created a, a, a humanitarian golden rice board of directors composed of people from around the world that are interested in this. Rockefeller Brothers is on there, Syngenta's foundation is on there, the International Rice Research Institute, and many others. And, and, I criticize and Rockefeller Portrafis. Brothers Fund a lot, but it sounds like they're actually on the side of the angels they on are. this one here. On this one they are, and on this one, the, the, the companies that owned the patents gave them freely to be given to freely to any farmer in the developing world that sells less than $10,000 worth of rice a year. And the thing that's about- like, That's gotta be the majority of, these are is. subsistence farmers. But it's also, the thing about golden rice is, rice is self-pollinating, therefore the seeds of the golden rice that is planted are true. Unlike plants that cross hybrid, that pollinate cross, where the offspring are not identical to the original rice. Right. The golden rice seeds, the seeds that are from the golden rice, you can plant them again and you'll get more golden rice so plants. Once so it'll so multiply like wildfire. So you're a poor farmer in India, you're earning less than 10 grand a year, most people in India do. Exactly. You get this free GMO golden rice from Monsanto or this trust. They still have to pay for their rice seed, but they don't pay for the trait of the golden part. Right. So it's, yeah. They're just okay. paying the same amount as they would normally for yeah, rice so seed. Whereas most genetically modified seeds cost premium. more because they produce better. We're almost out of time in this segment. You told us the wonderful part. I gotta part. tell you what I'm doing here today. But, but uh, let me jump in first. What's the problem? I mean, you got a, a professor inventor, you got this bo board of trustees, you got the charities, you got the companies, you got the plan. What has stopped it? The anti-GMO anti movement led by Greenpeace has created so much red tape and so much propaganda. Even in India and Bangladesh? Yes, Frankenstein, Terminator, Killer Tomato. Do they listen to that BS yes, in third world do, countries? Yes, they do, they, they, they put horrible posters up de depicting GMO as like aliens from outer space. When in fact, every academy of science supports GMOs. We and so eat GMO does food here in Canada, I corn, know, soybeans, uh, 10 percent of the oil. world's cropland is in GM food. But they're attacking golden rice because they know if golden rice is approved, then that is b game over for their anti-GMO campaign. What bugs me the most is there's an inherent racism here. Here in Canada, we're fat, well-to-do, generally white folks. We eat GMO food every day. But it, all those countries you mentioned are poor, developing country, frankly, visible minorities and Greenpeace and their fancy offices in Amsterdam are saying, you poor starving people, we know better than you. You can't have golden rice. What are you doing about it? We, we're almost out of time in this segment. You got this brochure, you got this group called Allow G Golden Rice Now. We're what are you launching, doing? We're launching our campaign tonight at Popper's Pub here at 539 Bloor Street West at seven o'clock tonight. And tomorrow morning, we're gonna be starting our direct action and we'll be announcing that tonight. Direct action, I love the sound this of that. Is, sort of like you taking on the, this the, is, the Amchitka H-ball. This is a direct action campaign and we're gonna shame Greenpeace into making an exception for Golden Rice. We're not asking them to give up their general dislike of GMOs, which is misguided to begin with, yeah. but we're not asking them to do that. Right. We're saying just make an exception for golden rice because people are, 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 are so in need of this. Two million dying every year children and they're saying un, uh, uh, unknown future consequences may happen. <laughs> unknown. Yeah. Unknown versus so an, two million dying yeah, every year which is known thing that you can't even say what yeah. it might be yeah. because it's beta carotene it's, in rice. It's that David Suzuki yeah. hocus pocus. Well, I, I just heard so much of what he said. Every time he answered a question, he says, we don't know enough. Yeah. We don't know anything about we know that. Two million we don't know. Dying. We're out of right? time in this segment. We got to go to commercial I break. I know. The stay two here, folks, dying. and you stay there. This is a great segment. Dr. Moore's with us the whole day. When it comes to renewable energy, what's the best? After the break, we'll broach the issue of climate change with Dr. Moore. That's next on The Source. Hottest years on record, as I understand it, have been in this century. In fact, the warming continues. I say, let's wait for the IPCC report to come out and see what the vast bulk of scientists who've been involved in, in gathering this uh, information will tell us. I'm not, you know, we can cherry pick all kinds of stuff. Cherry pick, in fact, the scientists that we want to listen to. But let's uh, listen to the IPCC.
Oh, that was just a short clip from this Australian adventure. When someone in the crowd said, well, the IPCC is showing that there's been no temperature growth in 15 years, he didn't understand the references. He said, what, what are you referring to? What are those scientific institutions? It was a meltdown. Australians were rolling their eyes at this guy is the leading public scientist in Canada? No, he's not. He's the leading scientician, showman, entertainer. I think we've got the leading environmental scientist right here, Dr. Patrick Moore. Your book, Confessions of a Greenpeace Dropout, you got a new 2013 edition. It's must-reading for anyone who's interested in environmentalism that's sensible, that works, that, that actually helps people. That's the thing, eh? I mean, if we were to de-fossil fuel, decarbonize our economy, what would life be like? Well, just for fun, think that the fossil fuels are cut off tomorrow. There wouldn't be a tree left on this planet in six months. And I bet a quarter of the population would die within that same period, too. People would chop down the trees to burn them? Is that yes, what you mean? for energy, to cook and to heat. But how would you get to work in your car? How would food be delivered to the grocery markets? I mean, it, you just think about 88% of all the energy in the world is fossil fuels. And I'm the first one that believes in conservation and efficiency and reducing our, ne our necessity for excess amounts of energy. I, I drive a smart car. I try my very best to live a life that is reducing the amount of energy I use. But to say that we should ban, you know, ban this and ban that and cut off pipelines and stop super tankers, you can't do that. Otherwise, people will suffer by the hundreds of millions. It, 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 it's, it's impossible. It would undermine civilization overnight. And you, you've got Greenpeace now, basically. And this thing in, in Russia, where the 30 of them have been arrested, they were trying to scale a large Russian oil rig. And how did they get to that large Russian oil rig? In a diesel-powered boat. Mm. That's how they got there. The, the irony's lost on them. I mean, you were saying earlier that one of the transformations in Greenpeace was instead of saving humanity, regarding humanity as the problem. And if you combine their opposition to GMO food and their opposition to fossil fuels, it's tough to come away with any other conclusion that Greenpeace now thinks that people are a cancer on the earth. They're also against farming the sea. Uh, David Suzuki's henchmen have blackmailed nearly every good restaurant in Vancouver into taking farmed salmon off the menu and only serving wild BC salmon. AKA Alaskan it, salmon that happens no, to no, be paid for. No, no, it's BC salmon oh, probably. BC, yeah. But how does it save the salmon to eat more of them? That's what yeah. I don't understand. The wild salmon. He's yeah. saying only eat wild salmon. Yeah. Don't eat farm salmon. Every farm salmon you eat saves a wild salmon. That's a good point. It's so yeah, ridiculous. That, that would be like saying don't eat cattle from a farm, just go out and eat free roaming buffalo the exactly. free roaming buffalo exactly. uh, i mean sounds delicious but they'd be gone in a heartbeat yeah, I mean, i'm not against salmon fishing i do it myself but yeah. it's got to be regulated yeah. and there isn't enough wild salmon to provide enough good healthy fish to people with with the farming we're producing a hundred times more salmon yeah. than we used you to. you know what i mean i think of the cod fishery off the atlantic just gone that was of course was the wild cod if if i mean aquaculture uh, I mean, that's the phrase for fish farming. Tell me a little bit more about that industry. It's bizarre to me, and I mentioned this in my opening monologue. David Suzuki's taken hundreds of thousands of dollars from anti-fish farming lobby groups, and surprise, he, he's called them poison. I mean, again, that's not scientific language to say a farmed fish is poison. Is that that's Actually, the way to prevent a severe heart attack and death from heart attacks is to eat oily fish like salmon and tuna. And, and the, the, you'll, you'll find that... If you look at what Suzuki is saying, he's saying there's some PCBs in the farm salmon. There's also PCBs in the wild salmon in, an, in all of our oily uh, f food because PCBs are in the environment. But it's in such low levels, there's no possibility of it causing any harm. Whereas if you eat oily fish, you prevent 400 heart attacks out of 100,000 people. 400 fatal heart attacks. It's been proven by the health institutes and the nutritionists. Nutritionists are all in favor of eating more oily fish, and salmon farms are not only doing that. First, they take the pressure off the wild stocks. It means that you have lots of fish that is not having to take it out of the wild, so you can, you can reduce the catch on the wild stocks. Second, it provides year-round employment yeah. in remote coastal communities where fishing only provides employment for a couple of months. Well, that's and great, third, yeah. it provides the healthiest food for people at a reasonable price. It's a third the price of wild salmon. Huh. You know, that's the thing. I mean, wild salmon sounds so much healthier, but if, if it's only caught for a few months a year, odds are you're buying that wild salmon. It was, it's been on ice for But why months. wouldn't wild chicken be healthier? Yeah. Wild cows. Yeah. They're not. Yeah. Huh. I mean, there aren't any. Huh. Jeez, it's <laughs> that's because we ate them all. Yeah. Many you know, years it's ago. It's very strange. And, and 
I don't mind people who say this is my religion or this is my hunch. But what bugs me about St. Suzuki is he passes off his, his religion or his hunch as true science, and it's anything but. Dr. Moore, you stay right there after the break. Folks, we're going to talk the latest IPCC report on climate change. But first, when it comes to the population, how many is too many people on this earth? That's next on The Source. We're beyond the carrying capacity of the planet for our species. But it's not just a matter of numbers. It's a matter of consumption per person. And certainly when you look at the consumptive pattern of our populations, the industrialized world uh, is the most overpopulated uh, part of our species. That coming from a guy with five kids himself, three homes, jets around the world, and weirdly, he says we're overpopulated, coming from Canada, one of the most sparsely populated countries in the world. That's the junk scientist king of Canada. I don't believe a word he says. I don't think it's scientific. But joining us in studio for the whole show today is a true scientist and a passionate environmentalist, Dr. Patrick Moore. Of course, his book, it's must-reading, is called Confessions of a Greenpeace Dropout, and you can get it on Amazon or you can get it an e-book, too. You know, I, here, we're, we're coming back to the theme. I think you nailed it. I think you nailed it. These guys actually think people are the problem. I, on this show, sometimes I talk about Reverend Thomas Malthus, who 215 years ago wrote a book about population. He said, well, you know, fields only grow arithmetically, but population grows, you know, uh, exponentially. exponentially. Thanks for that. <laughs> I was thinking the word hyperbolically. <laughs> um, so we're all going to starve. In fact, in his book, he said that the UK would run out of food in 1850. Well, of course, it's 2013, and they've never been fatter. There's 7 billion people in the world. We've never had more food. But they think we're all going to die, don't they? Yes, they do. Now, it, it, is, it is kind of a theological question about how many is the right number of people. I don't think there's actually an answer to that. I bet that. you every individual thinks but, that they should be around. But, yeah, of like, course. Like, I think I should be around. But David makes a lot of fundamental contradictions here. He says that the industrial world is the most overpopulated because of our rate of consumption. Well, actually, we have better records on environment in the industrial world in terms of air pollution than many of the developing countries. You want to see the effects of poverty on the environment, where people can't afford to clean the water after they make it dirty, where they can't afford to replant trees after they cut them down, where they can't afford the fertilizers to keep their soil in a healthy condition. So don't tell me that rich people are damaging the environment more than poor people are. It's simply not true. And in addition, in the industrialized countries, population has stopped growing. Yeah. It's only because of immigration that population grows in Europe and North America and New Zealand, Australia and Japan. The, the internal rate of population is actually negative in some of these countries. So my belief is that we have to mechanize agriculture in the developing world and they too will stop having big families for, for cheap labor in their, sub, in, in their subsistence agriculture. Yeah. And then the women will become educated and empowered politically They'll have small families, and they will become better educated, and they will stop growing in their population. The, look at where the population has stopped growing. It's where only 2 or 3% of the people are growing the food with mechanization, chemicals, fertilizer, genetics, yeah. technology, right? And this organic movement is ridiculous. It would take four times as much land to grow the food. How, how are we going to save wild nature if we have to cut it all down to grow more food? Yeah. We, should be, we should be using the technology we have to have intensive agricultural production where you grow a lot of food on a small area and then you don't have to cut as much nature down to do it. And, but these guys are against that. And so Suzuki and Greenpeace and their allies are teaching the public a lot of what are actually anti-environmental messages, like stop cutting trees. Uh, excuse me, what's the most important renewable resource in the world by far, not only for material but also for energy, wood and other biomass? We should be growing more trees and using more wood, and then we wouldn't have to use as much steel, concrete, and plastic to build our infrastructure. They're telling the exact opposite message. They're saying no to golden rice, which is perpetuating the death of two million kids every year. They're saying we've got to cut out fossil fuel, hydro, and nuclear, which would leave the world with no energy to power its civilization, and everybody would be living in poverty, or either that or be, they'd be dead. So the, the, the prescription that they are offering up is more damaging both to humans and the environment than the status quo is. Yeah, I want to see things to evolve in a much more uh, logical 
and technologically feasible way and economically feasible way. And that's why I wrote Confessions of a Greenpeace Dropout. Not only to tell the 15 years of my history with Greenpeace and how the movement evolved, but to show people that there are different ways of looking at agriculture, forestry, mining. Greenpeace is against all mining. There's no mine they support, yet they have cell phones, bicycles, uh, laptops, a ship made out of steel. A ship made of steel. They fly around to international climate change meetings all over the place in aircraft that are made of metal. And if you're not living mining. like Ted Kaczynski right? in the forest in a hut, you, there's some inconsistency. And even Kaczynski had plastic jugs for water. Yeah, but none of these people are living like. Ted well, Kaczynski. that's my point. They're, yeah. they're jet setters. I mean, I've seen pictures of David Suzuki's home. It's a it's a castle. Now I got a question for you. You mentioned organic food. I don't know a lot about organic food. When I see an organic label, I think snob tax. Because you're snobby and, oh, I want to be fancy, and I'm willing to pay an extra dollar for a bunch of bananas. Doesn't taste any different, uh, not any healthier for me, but I get to be organic. I'm sort of fancy. It's like I'm driving a Toyota Prius, so I get to, you know, lord it over my friends a bit. Is there a nutritional or a health difference between organic and regular, or is one just a tax on people with more money than brains? I actually think the Prius is okay, but it does cost twice as much as a Toyota Corolla. And take the R out of it, and you got pious. <laughs> and, uh, okay, well, let's put aside that one. Yeah. You know let's what? talk about the organic. First off, a major study out of Stanford not that long ago demonstrated conclusively that there's no nutritional benefit and no safety benefit. Right, they say there's pesticide residues in conventional food. There is not enough pesticide residues in conventional food to even worry about. You should worry about the healthy food you're eating because it's full of vitamins and minerals and antioxidants. You know, it's good for you to eat this food and it's not full of chemicals. And if the it's expensive, you're probably gonna eat less of it, especially found, if you're poor. They found pesticide residues in a lot of the organic food too, like about 23% of it. So, so what's, what's the marketing value? Is it, is it that snob it is, appeal? It, it is marketing. Yes, it's making people feel that they're better. That yeah. they're, they're, that, and it, some people actually believe that it's better for you, even though the science says it isn't. Uh. That it tastes better. They say it tastes better. Well, okay, if you're willing to pay twice as much and then you're also willing to trick yourself psychologically yeah. into thinking it actually tastes better, okay. I gotta come up with an invention like that, I'd be a billionaire. <laughs> <laughs> hey, stick around, doctor. Folks, not all energy sources are equal. So which green energy is the best? After the break, we'll respond to the latest IPCC report, I promise. That's next on The Source. Nevertheless, in our assessment, we could make statements about the likelihood that certain temperatures, like 1.5 degrees Celsius or 2 degrees Celsius, would be exceeded by the end of the 21st century. That's the UN's top climate bureaucrat. You hear what he's talking about? Our predictions, our certainties, in the future, in the next century. He's asking you to believe him for his predictions. This is the fifth time he's asking you to believe that. But over the past 15 years, we've had a chance to prove whether or not their predictions are accurate by testing their computer models against our actual observations. And let me show you a summary of the last 15 years. This was published, as you know, because I've shown it to you before, in a prestigious scientific journal called Nature Climate Change, that's the headline of the article, Overestimated Global Warming Over the Past 20 Years, peer-reviewed study. And look at this graph at the top right there. We're gonna blow it up on the screen. It's my favorite graph. This shows 117 official IPCC climate models. Out of 117 of them, 114 were high by a long shot. That red thing that looks like, you know, the Eiffel Tower or whatever, that's the actual observed temperature of 0.05 degrees per decade, almost nothing. But all those gray bars are that guy's former predictions. They're all wrong. Dr. Moore, after a certain point in time when you keep predicting something is gonna happen, gonna happen, please just one more time, give me one more chance. 15 years in a row they got it wrong. They're asking for another 15 years. If we just hold tight, this global warming will come back any moment now. What do you think of it? Well, they're trying to put off the inevitable if temperatures do not continue to rise even further into the future. It's already been 15 years and there's been no perceptible increase, even though CO2 levels in the atmosphere continue to go up. So they're now having to say that, well, some natural factors are suppressing what would have otherwise been a continued rise in temperature. Great, lucky for us but humans. They don't, know, they're not, they don't know what those, quote, natural factors are. They're just saying natural factors. Mm. and. It, it, it has become almost laughable. And now they have decided in their summary for policymakers, 
which is the small document they put out that is actually the political document that goes along with this huge tome of scientific papers. The political document is hiding the 15-year hiatus. Hi they're hiding the trick to hide the hiatus. And in addition to that, they are basically not recognizing this th this difference in prediction versus what is actually happening. You know, I, there's an anti oil sands, anti-fossil fuel group called 350.org. And I... Bill hate, McGibbon's group. That's right. Yeah. And it, they chose that number because that was where they claimed the carbon tipping point is. 350 parts per million in the atmosphere of yeah. carbon dioxide, we're all going to die. Well, CO2 is now blown way past that. It's around 400 it is. parts per million, largely because of China's emissions. I mean, they're all industrializing there. So you would think that if the theory was right, the temperature would be roaring like a furnace, but there's a decoupling between the carbon going up and temperature going flat. This is where a real scientist would say, well, we had a theory, the facts don't support it, check out the theory and come they're, up with a new like one. They're like acting as if there's only one thing that causes climate change, and that's CO2, whether it's high or low. And they're also ignoring the fact that CO2 is lower now, even at 400 parts per million, than it has been for nearly the entire history of life on Earth. Mm -hmm. Going back to 550 million years ago when modern life forms emerged, CO2 was about 10 to 20 times higher than that it is now. Mm -hmm. In other words, it was in the 4 to 5,000 parts per million range back then, and it's 400 now. Mm -hmm. and 150 million years ago, it was at 1,500 parts per million, and it's been at 2,000 parts per million average for the history of modern life. In other words, it's been at five times what it is today. And, and, and there were ice ages during one of those periods when CO2 was five times as high as it is today. So it would appear from the ge geological history that CO2 may be a factor, but it certainly isn't the main factor. Now, you and I were on this Freedom Cruise. I mentioned that recently. We went up to a glacier national park in Alaska where we sailed into this fjord and we saw these massive, gorgeous glaciers calving into the sea. It was very exciting. But we, we heard that these glaciers have come and gone and come and gone, receded and advanced all the time. In yes. fact, w within the last hundred years, they've, they've moved, you know, hundreds of feet, even, uh, I guess, a kilometer. But so. the native people have been there for 5,000 years, and they have recorded five advances and retreats of the glacier, big ones, yeah. just during that time. Yeah. So, and, and sci these scientists at the IPCC, they don't try to figure out what caused that. They don't know what caused that. It wasn't people, obviously. Mm -hmm. Not a bunch of little natives with their, with their campfire up there it was not going to cause glaciers to retreat and advance. And so they're, they're basically ignoring almost the entire history of life on Earth and of all of the glaciations that have occurred through history. There's been four or five of them through the history of the Earth, three of them since modern life emerged. This is the most recent one we're in now. Take note, the poles are covered in ice. North so we and are south. in an ice age of sorts. We are in sorts. an ice age. Yeah. No, not of sorts. This yeah. is a full-blown ice age. Okay. We're just not in one of the extreme parts, the, what we call the glaciations, the major glaciations. Right. We're in a, an, an interglacial period of an ice age. Oh. The, the, the planet's temperature today is 14.5 degrees Celsius on average. During the ice age, it was about 12 degrees. Hmm. During the greenhouse ages, which have occupied by far more of the time since life has, modern life has existed, were 22, 23 degrees oh. Celsius. The, wow. whole, the, the Arctic islands of Canada were forested three million years ago, oh. and for 100 million years before that, they were forested. Oh. The remains of those trees are still there in, in petrified form and in preserved form in oh. mud. There's, there's still, you can still go up and see the That's evidence amazing. of it. That's amazing. That's amazing. We've got to take a break, but we do come back. We've got one more great segment with Dr. Patrick Moore. When it comes to practice, what is the greatest of green energies? But the details have been great. Fracking is one of the dumbest technologies there is. We have no idea what is under the ground. You know, it's, we're kind of, because we're an air-breathing land lubber living on the top skin of the planet, we think out of sight, there's nothing down there. We have no idea what we're doing when we pump vast amounts of water down there. We have no idea whether it'll end up contaminating the, our drinking water. We don't know. But we're just going to go down there and try to, uh, to frack the, as much gas as we can get out of the ground. This is just, I think, crazy. That guy calls himself a scientist. We have no idea what's down there. There could be dragons or maybe friendly elves. But we're landlubbers, so I, mean, I can't believe that guy calls himself a scientist. That, and to call a technology dumb, 
They actually it's have a, they have a pretty good idea of what the Earth is made out of right to the center of the Earth. <laughs> You know, I mean, certainly we know about the Earth's crust and how it is formed and what the layers of rocks are. Well, we've been drilling Where and they, mining since the Roman times. Of course we have. But I mean, now with modern technology, with all those geotech stuff where they can just fly over the Earth and see down two miles Did into they find it. any elves? We should tell David Suzuki. <laughs> He's scared. Listen, we only got about three minutes. That's nuts. So. I can't believe that. I, I, I was embarrassed as a Canadian. That I mean, the Australian Broadcasting Corporation laid out the red carpet for this guy. They had all these great yeah. questioners, and he was just bumbling off like that. You should recognize that gas replaces coal in most cases. We can, if, if you want to have cleaner fuel, move to gas and off coal. And, and he also is against hydroelectric, though, which is the cleanest, and it's, ver, it's renewable. So if you're against it, the cleanest renewable energy that provides more electricity at a good price than any other renewable electricity source in the world, he's against that. Jeez. He's, of course, he's against nuclear energy, yeah. even though it's safety record. Never mind Fukushima. Nobody died from well, radiation. 18,000 people died in a tsunami. Nobody died from radiation, and no one will. According yeah. to the best experts, no one received enough radiation yeah. to cause any discernible health effect in the future. So they're against that. So they're against fossil fuels, they're against hydroelectric, they're against nuclear. If you want to replace fossil fuels, nuclear and hydroelectric are the way to go. In fact, today, right now, the nuclear and hydro we have in this world is reducing CO2 emissions, if you care about that, by 35 times as much as the wind and solar that's been installed at triple the price. So there's, there's no doubt about it. The, the best green energies are hydroelectric, nuclear energy and ground source heat pumps in the end and heat pumps of all kinds because the most of our energy that's used in our lives is in buildings people think it's the cars and trucks and trains but transport is actually third after buildings infrastructure and industry and then transport and those are the three big blocks but but infrastructure buildings use more energy than anything else and if we can put ground source heat pumps run with hydroelectric and nuclear energy in our buildings, there's no fossil fuels involved anymore. Uh, last talk about uh, fracking. You mentioned it briefly. Fracking has been credited with reducing U.S. greenhouse gas emissions to levels not seen in 20 years. Again, I don't Because believe, it's replacing coal. I don't believe that uh, CO2 is a problem, but it's amazing that this new technology has done what no Kyoto Treaty could. But it's also reducing air pollution because coal has a lot more air pollution than natural gas does. It's about a 90% reduction when you switch from coal to natural gas. So th these people are crazy. They are so counterproductive yeah. and self-defeating in the things that they are saying that th they would make a, the world so much worse than it is now if we listen to them. Well, and, and they're we supposed have been to be the to, environmentalists. We've been listening to that guy supposed for to be leading bit. us into utopia. Yeah, you know, and they're leading us down a road of, of good intentions. Pay, you know, and it's you know where it's going. Well, that's what I like about you is that you've got the idealism. I mean, you were there. You earned your 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 spurs. Uh, out on the ships, taken on the U. I mean, you still love whales. You, you, you're against the seal hunt. I mean, you and I agree on a lot of things. Not 100 percent, but you're a passionate idealist. Well, I just don't think they should be slaughtering day. thousands of babies in front of their well, mothers while they're I'm not, still nursing. I'm not disagreeing. I'm know. saying the opposite. They kill, got this kill them when they get a little older. You've got this passion, and but you want to apply it to the real world. You're not a dreamer or a wacko like him. I'm so glad I've spent the last hour with you, and I wish you good luck in your fight to allow goldenricenow.org. Folks, check out Dr. Moore's website, allowgoldenricenow.org. Get his book, Confessions of a Greenpeace Dropout. He's a great environmentalist, a great public scientist, and a great friend of the source. Good night, everybody.
Fracking is one of the dumbest technologies there is. We have no idea what is under the ground. You know, it's, we're kind of, because we're an air-breathing land lubber living on the top skin of the planet, we think out of sight, there's nothing down there. We have no idea what we're doing when we pump vast amounts of water down there. We have no idea whether it'll end up contaminating the, our drinking water. We don't know. But we're just going to go down there and try to, uh, to frack the, as much gas as we can get out of the ground. This is just, I think, crazy. That guy calls himself a scientist. We have no idea what's down there. There could be dragons or maybe friendly elves. But we're landlubbers, so I, mean, I can't believe that guy calls himself a scientist. That, and to call a technology dumb. They actually have a, they have a pretty good idea of what the Earth is made out of right to the center of the Earth. <laughs> You know, I mean, certainly we know about the Earth's crust and how it is formed and what the layers of rocks are. Well, we've been drilling Where and they, mining since the Roman times. Of course we have. But I mean, now with modern technology, with all those geotech stuff where they can just fly over the Earth and see down two miles Did into they find it. any elves? We should tell David Suzuki. <laughs> He's scared. Listen, we only got about three minutes. That's nuts. So. I can't believe that. I, I, I was embarrassed as a Canadian. That I mean, the Australian Broadcasting Corporation laid out the red carpet for this guy. They had all these great yeah. questioners, and he was just bumbling off like that. You should recognize that gas replaces coal. In most cases, we can, if, if you want to have cleaner fuel, move to gas and off coal. And, and he also is against hydroelectric, though, which is the cleanest, and it's, ver it's renewable. So if you're against it, the cleanest renewable energy that provides more electricity at a good price than any other renewable electricity source in the world, he's against that. Jeez. He's, of course, he's against nuclear energy, yeah. even though it's safety record. Never mind Fukushima. Nobody died from well, radiation. 18,000 people died in a tsunami. Nobody died from radiation, and no one will. According yeah. to the best experts, no one received enough radiation yeah. to cause any discernible health effect in the future. So they're against that. So they're against fossil fuels, they're against hydroelectric, they're against nuclear. If you want to replace fossil fuels, nuclear and hydroelectric are the way to go. In fact, today, right now, the nuclear and hydro we have in this world is reducing CO2 emissions, if you care about that, by 35 times as much as the wind and solar that's been installed at triple the price. So there's, there's no doubt about it. The, the best green energies are hydroelectric, nuclear energy and ground source heat pumps in the end and heat pumps of all kinds because the most of our energy that's used in our lives is in buildings people think it's the cars and trucks and trains but transport is actually third after buildings infrastructure and industry and then transport and those are the three big blocks but but infrastructure buildings use more energy than anything else and if we can put ground source heat pumps run with hydroelectric and nuclear energy in our buildings, there's no fossil fuels involved anymore. Uh, last talk about uh, fracking, you mentioned it briefly. Fracking has been credited with reducing U.S. greenhouse gas emissions to levels not seen in 20 years. Again, I don't Because believe, it's replacing coal. I don't believe that uh, CO2 is a problem, but it's amazing that this new technology has done what no Kyoto Treaty could. But it's also reducing air pollution because coal has a lot more air pollution than natural gas does. It's about a 90% reduction when you switch from coal to natural gas. So th these people are crazy. They are so counterproductive yeah. and self-defeating in the things that they are saying that th they would make a, the world so much worse than it is now if we listen to them. Well, and, and they're we supposed have been to be the to, environmentalists. We've been listening to that guy supposed for Supposed to be a fair leading bit. us into utopia. Yeah. You know, and they're leading us down a road of, of good intentions, pay, you know, and it's, you know where it's going. Well, that's what I like about you is that you've got the idealism. I mean, you were there. You earned your, your, your spurs. Uh, out on the ships, taken on the U. I mean, you still love whales. You, you, you're against the seal hunt. I mean, you and I agree on a lot of things. Not 100 percent, but you're a passionate idealist. Well, I just don't think they should be slaughtering day. thousands of babies in front of their well, mothers while they're I'm not, still nursing. I'm not disagreeing. You I'm know, saying the opposite. They kill, got this kill them when they get a little older. You've got this passion, and but you want to apply it to the real world. You're not a dreamer or a wacko like him. I'm so glad I've spent the last hour with you, and I wish you good luck in your fight to allow goldenricenow.org. Folks, check out Dr. Moore's website, allowgoldenricenow.org. Get his book, Confessions of a Greenpeace Dropout. He's a great environmentalist, a great public scientist, and a great friend of the source. Good night, everybody.